De verhalen over klimaatverandering, vervuiling en verlies van biodiversiteit kennen we inmiddels. Stel nou eens dat we de natuur niet meer verdringen en vernietigen, maar dat we samenwerken met de natuur. Stel dat we onze maatschappij zo inrichten dat alle organismen om ons heen ook de ruimte krijgen om te leven. Stel dat we met onze spullen ook een bijdrage leveren aan gezonde lucht, schoon water en vruchtbare grond. Stel dat we in een harmonische, symbiotische relatie met de natuur leven. I want a new narrative. I want it to be creative. I want it to be scientifically based. I want it to be able to give people of the generation that wants to live in a symbiocene rather than an anthropocene reason for hope, reason for uh, thinking that there is work to be done, there's creativity to be undertaken. Milieufilosoof Glenn Albrecht is de bedenker van een nieuw tijdperk, het symbiocene en een nieuwe taal om dat tijdperk te beschrijven. Een tijdperk waarin de mens volledig met de natuur samenwerkt. Glenn Elbrecht was hoogleraar duurzaamheid aan de Murdoch University in West-Australië... en woont midden tussen de eucalyptusbomen en wallabies. The native wallaby that lives in this area is called the red-necked wallaby. And the property is really uh, a sanctuary for the wildlife. We're, we're not a productive farm in, in any meaningful way, except apart from our chickens and a few vegetables. So Wallaby Farm is the home of the red-necked wallabies. And we, we hope that they find it a peaceful and safe place to live out their lives. And there's certainly at times plenty of them here. Hij noemt zichzelf het liefst milieufilosoof en ziet een nieuw tijdperk voor zich. Een tijdperk dat nog moet gaan komen en waarin de mens niet meer boven de natuur staat, maar in de natuur. En waarin mens en natuur van elkaar profiteren in een symbiotische relatie. Well, it, it, it does engage the, the science of symbiosis as it's been developed over the last couple of hundred years. The idea that um, life, particularly complex life, uh, exists by these uh, interrelationships, mutual, uh, uh, mutually beneficial relationships, usually, uh, between different organisms uh, at various scales. Zo'n 3,5 miljard jaar geleden ontstond het eerste leven op aarde. Daaruit ontwikkelde zich een natuur waarin organismen afhankelijk van elkaar werden in ecosystemen. Veel organismen gingen onderlinge relaties met elkaar aan die gunstig waren voor beide partijen. Soms werden ze zelfs zo afhankelijk van elkaar dat ze eigenlijk niet meer zonder elkaar kunnen voortbestaan. Een fenomeen dat bekend staat als symbiose. Humans are a relatively recently evolved life form. We've, uh, Homo sapiens have been around for what, 200,000, 300,000 years. We've emerged from other life forms uh, through Darwinian evolution. And we've also, uh, we could express it as a form of uh, uh, evolution by symbiosis. We've discovered that humans, for example, uh, have microbiomes that keep us alive and healthy and even affect our moods. In our, in it, our guts. In our guts, yes, our gut microbiome. So we discovered that we're actually not uh, a purebred species, that we're, we, we consist of, of uh, many other species, uh, parasites, viruses, bacteria, fungi, that are all part of this great... I mean, uh, we, we've, we call it the web of life. Um, this interrelationship is critical for uh, what it is uh, to be human and to, uh, to understand what we are. For me, it's the most important discovery we've made as humans uh, in the last two or three hundred years. And yet we haven't incorporated that 
discovery about what constitutes a human being into our policy, into our ethics, into the politics. So we're, we're floundering at the moment and um, I'm doing my bit as a thinker to try and sober us up, to, to get us to think about what we really are. De mens heeft de natuur de afgelopen twee eeuwen flink op de schop genomen. Onze kennis en onze machines ontketenden een nieuwe kracht die het aanzien van de aarde dramatisch heeft veranderd. Een kracht die ons weliswaar veel heeft gebracht, maar die nu wouden wegvaagt, ecosystemen vernietigt en diersoorten uitroeit. We hebben het tijdperk waarin de mens het aanzien van de aarde bepaalt zelfs een naam gegeven. Het antropoceen, naar het oud-Griekse woord antropos, wat mens betekent. The vision that we can continue to develop based on extraction and pollution is not viable. We can see that just with the case study of climate change. We know that we're going to uh, create a, a world which is, if not unlivable, is going to be continually moving in that direction uh, with more severe consequences, more death, more famine, more conflict between people and a massive loss of biodiversity. It's dystopia writ large, it's uh, ecocide um, unfolding itself. We don't want to go in those directions. So I, I don't think we have any choice but to go in the direction of the symbiocene, even if we don't know exactly what it looks like. So in order to bring it about, we have to shift from extraction and pollution into a, uh, a model of living, uh, a human life, uh, our cultural, technological and every aspect of life, which is in harmony with what we see in the structure and processes of life uh, in the rest of the, the biosphere. And my way of understanding that is to say that we copy, we replicate, the forms and processes that other natural systems use to replicate themselves and to reproduce and to grow and to become more complex in science and technological terms and also in our economic, agricultural and other systems that we need to keep ourselves alive and thriving. So just about the way I like to think about it is that every single artifact that's built in the toxic Anthropocene we either have to ditch it or we have to replace it with a symbio fact. It's opposite in the symbiocene produced by living processes, entirely non-toxic, entirely biodegradable, uh, entirely something which if we don't want it anymore, it goes into the compost heap and starts growing vegetables. Het leeghalen van de aarde is precies de reden waarom Glenn Elbrecht het laatste decennium activistisch is geworden. Toen hij jaren geleden verhuisde naar het oosten van Australië... verheugde hij zich op de regio die bekend staat om zijn overweldigende natuur... en rijkdom aan planten en dieren. Maar in de vlakbij zijn huis gelegen Huntervallei... werd de natuur opeens bruut overhoop gehaald door de kolenindustrie. We gaan naar Musselbrook. We'll do a big circle of the active coal mines of the Upper Hunter Valley. And that will give you a really good idea of the extent of the mining and the impact that it's having on the land. And I guess the impact that it's having on people as well. It's uh, an incredible scar on the landscape. I mean, this place used to be called the Tuscany of the South. Rolling green hills, beautiful scenery. It's famous for uh, its thoroughbred horse studs and its wonderful vineyards, but also now infamous because of the coal mining that you can see behind me. So it's, it's a huge area for black coal and it's mined using the largest machinery we have in the world for mining. And bucket load by bucket load, they take the coal out of the strata of the rocks here. The people who live close to these mines were experiencing a distress that's linked to the, the loss of their quality of life in a landscape that they once loved. 
uh, once we've felt part of. And so I felt a similar sadness and a similar distress when I first viewed what was happening to this valley. And you have to appreciate that it's hundreds of square kilometres uh, when you think of the cumulative impact of mining in this valley. I mean, these people were familiar with beautiful, clear skies, unpolluted water, a night sky that enabled you to look up at the stars and the Southern Cross and the Milky Way without any trouble whatsoever. But now we've got polluted skies, we've got polluted water, the air is foul, there are explosions every few days as they detonate the, the panels that reveal more coal. And the trucking and the cars, it's all to do with mining. This used to be a very quiet rural area. So every single value that r rural people enjoyed has been taken away from them. And the noise. And, and the noise. You can see that this represents extractionism at its worst. This is the uh, humans being parasitical on what is valuable to them on this planet. So yes, it's the Anthropocene personified. Het gevoel van Elbrecht en de mensen die dicht bij de mijn wonen was voor hem als milieufilosoof aanleiding om te gaan zoeken naar woorden die te maken hebben met wat mensen voelen als het milieu om hen heen sterk verandert. Die zoektocht resulteerde in een scala aan zelfbedachte nieuwe woorden die hij vastlegde in een boek, Earth Emotions. The idea that in such an important psychological event is going on, but no academics were studying it. There were no words to bring into prominence what these people were feeling, just straight descriptive terms like I'm distressed, I'm unhappy. Well, humans are unhappy about millions of things. People are distressed by tens of thousands of things. What was common in the Hunter Valley was these people were distressed by their relationship to their home, the earth. And so there was a whole domain there that needed uh, to be explained in more detail. Uh, so I call it the psychoterratic, another one of the terms that I've created, psyche-earth relationships, both good and bad. And it amazed me then I, when I had that thought that why, why, why didn't this domain exist before? And then I started to think about, well, yes, it is the, the speed of the transition. It's the power of the technologies that we're now using. It's the fact that we've been dominated by a different value system for a few hundred years only, the, the, the value system of globalised uh, capitalism, to give it its correct name. Volgens Glenn Elbrecht bestonden er geen woorden die de emoties uitdrukken die mensen voelen als ze zich druk maken over het lot van de natuur en de planeet. Zijn boek Earth Emotions bevat daarom nieuwe, niet altijd makkelijk te onthouden woorden die de emoties weergeven. Bijvoorbeeld het woord Terraftora. Terra the earth and, and fora, I call them terra forans. And the, the word fora uh, comes from to destroy. And I wanted my own term to describe the, the types of humans that destroy the earth. And so uh, the, the terra forans are earth destroyers. And I've just made a category. Uh, and then I thought, well, if I've got earth destroyers, I need earth creators. So I've got terra nascent people who uh, you know, earth creators, the nascent is to do with birth and, and the whole process of creation. So it's like a, a creating your own great tragedy or drama. You, you've got to have characters and give them names. And I've and done negative that. Negative and positive. Yes, yes. And perhaps everything in between because not everyone's a terraforan and not everyone's a, a tree hugger. Um, so it's, it's to give people a way of describing what in the past has been difficult. And those terms may take decades before people are really familiar with them. Another one of my words is terra fury, earth anger. 
we're just getting so frustrated by the lack of response by the politicians of, to the information that they were putting into climate science or toxicology or any, any of the other areas that understand what we're doing wrong. So terra fury is what I'm feeling when I'm talking to you. I hopefully don't display it. You'll get angry. I, I, I won't get aggressive in front of you, but yes, I'm getting angry with the failure of humanity to respond to that which we already know. And it doesn't come from Nostradamus, this information. It comes from the best science that we have, from the, you know, the very best evidence that humans can produce through the system of knowledge we call science is now it's open to us, we, it's not even hidden. And yet we're still doing nothing. But our culture, our architecture, our technologies, they all need to start building this uh, idea of symbiosis into what they do. And so we can talk about, you know, the Sumbiopolis, a city that's animated by a new interconnection with life. We can talk about um, symbiocracy, which is the extension of democracy into a life-affirming decision-making system. What we have to do now is shift the focus from using nature in a way which is benign uh, and, and non-polluting at a subsistence level or a hunting and gathering level to one which is highly sophisticated, highly technological, uh, in intensely creative, uh, self-reflective so that we're constantly improving it and constantly uh, f trying to figure out better ways that we can uh, achieve this benign relationship to the rest of life. Now, I'm a philosopher, not a scientist, so I'm not, uh, I'm not going to come up with a Nobel Prize winning idea about the technologies that we need to do this. Technology is simply, for, uh, simply means for me some kind of uh, medium between human intelligence and the resources of the natural world. We know what's wrong with the current system and we're doing it because we're lazy, we're intellectually dumb. We're not using our brains to use the resources, the patterns, the models that are already in nature, which have tried and true over you know, 3.5 billion years of the evolution of life. If you're a betting person, you would say that those systems have actually got longevity and proven sustainability. The ones that don't are these ones that burn things, explode things, extract without care as to what impact they're having. They are short term and can only be short term. So the symbiocene is a, a meme, a, a culturally appropriate idea to try and think about a future which is the opposite of the culture and the technologies that we've built in the recent past. I want a new narrative. I want it to be creative. I want it to be scientifically based. I want it to be able to give people of the generation that wants to live in a symbiocene rather than an anthropocene. Uh, reason for hope, reason for uh, thinking that there's work to be done, there's uh, creativity to be undertaken. It does require a leap of faith of the ability of this thing called Homo sapiens to actually do some really intelligent thinking. But I'd much rather think about that than being depressed and sitting in the corner with my hands over my head, rocking back and forth.